Well, take your Bibles this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we want to say welcome to everybody online today. Uh, my goodness, it's, uh, it's amazing uh, the number of people that are listening online. And we appreciate you listening. We hope that wherever you're at that you're able to have a Bible-believing church, a church that you can attend and be part of and, and be a salt and light in your area and your, in your, your community. But if you don't have a, a Bible-believing church that preaches the old authorized version Bible, why, uh, maybe this will do to you, you can do otherwise. But we do appreciate you listening. Good to have visitors with us today. I think there's a family from Kansas here today, uh, back over there. We appreciate you folks being here today and making the drive to come down and be with us. And then I think there's some folks from Branson, Missouri with us today. We appreciate you all being with us. And there's probably some other folks here that I haven't run into. But that, Ralph, you're even here today, and it's good to have you and, and, and Christy today. Day. <laughs> anyway, Chris uh, sent us a text this week uh, that we're near a million listens on SermonAudio.com right now. And a million times that people have listened to messages on SermonAudio.com. God has opened doors in this church that's unbelievable. It really is. It's just un unbelievable. And uh, let's just keep praying, keep stepping through those doors, keep encouraging people, and just keep preaching the Word of God. Well, last Sunday morning... Uh, I was teaching on, I started teaching on judging. Now go to Second Samuel chapter 12. I hope you go there. And then you need to go to Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse number 1. And then Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. And uh, <clears throat> I want to preach this morning on the de devil's favorite Bible verse. Some of you may not have known that, but Satan has favorite Bible verses. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus Christ. That's how bold he is in misusing the Bible. The Bible, Peter said over in the book of Peter that there are people who will wrest the scriptures to their own destruction. They will take and twist the scriptures and use scriptures to destroy their own lives and to destroy the lives of other people. Cults do that. False teachers and so forth do that. One of the uh, things that's happened to America is that Satan has, they, it, it is said, and I, I think it's true, that probably 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the most well-known verse in America in the Bible was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that is not true in America today. The most well-known verse that people Americans know is Matthew 7.1. Judge not that you be not judged. There is a reason for that, and I'm going to this morning, hopefully, before we're done, show you how Satan has taken a Bible verse and destroyed the effectiveness of the church and of the message of the gospel. But before we get there, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, at this, in chapter 11 is the account of David's great sin, where he had a man killed. Uh, after he had uh, committed adultery with his wife, uh, he covered it up and all kinds of nonsense and got him drunk. And then that didn't work and then he had him killed. By the time you get to chapter 12, <clears throat> it's been a year or so. Actually, probably a little bit a year because the child is evidently alive because Nathan talks about the child is going to die. And then it says the child got sick. But what I want to do is just kind of take you back to that time. And I want you to just kind of imagine with me that here's the prophet Nathan. And God speaks to him. He says, I want you to go see David. David is not going to deal with this, and I want you to go see him. So he goes to him, and he tells him this story. And, and of course, Nathan and David are, are close. Nathan is the prophet, and Nathan has David's ear. Now, he says to him this. He says, um, there was a man uh, in this town, and he said he had a little ewe lamb. And he said that little ewe lamb was like a daughter to him. And he said it ate out of his, basically ate out of his plate and drunk out of his, his glass. And he said it was like a daughter to him. And he just had this one little ewe lamb. And then he said uh, there was a man on a journey came through, and there was another man, a rich man, and he had lots of sheep and lots of little ewes and all that. But this man came and to fix him dinner, he, went, he didn't take out of his flock. He went and got that poor man's little lamb and killed it and fed the stranger, the man was on a journey. Well, David, after he told, told that, David, the Bible said he got angry. 
And David said, the man that had done this shall surely die. Well, that was unscriptural. David was being real harsh in, in judging the man because that was unscriptural punishment. The Bible didn't say to kill a man for you know, stealing a sheep. And, uh, and David began to talk about what's going to happen and all that should happen to him. He's going to pay four, fourfold. And then Nathan said these words. He looked, I believe, looked right at, at David and said, David, thou art the man. And then David jumped up out of his chair and said, you're judging me. You don't have a right to be judging me. That's not what happened, is it? Not at all what happened. But nowadays, you don't have a right to judge me. I've noticed in comments on Facebook, you, you put a clip on there, and invariably they'll start this stuff. You have no right to be judging people. You have no right to be judging people. I don't judge people. You don't have a right. And, they just, and they're constantly accused, accuse you of judging. If you say anything of Bible truth, you're judging people. Let me tell you what made David, and, and I want you to get a hold of this, because you're living in this, and you're dealing with this every day of your life. I want you to get a hold of this this morning. I want to preach on judging. Biblical, righteous, and unrighteous judging, and what these passages of Scripture mean, and how you and I should respond in our day-by-day -day life with this issue that has just permeated this country. But let me tell you what made David, in the New Testament, they were able to say that David was a man after God's own heart. Did you know that, yes, Nathan was judging him. He said, thou art the man. Yeah. But David didn't have an attitude that nobody should judge him. Right. David humbled himself, admitted it. And, if, and by the way, if you read Psalms 51 where it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. It says at the top of that Psalms that this is the Psalm that David prayed after Nathan visited him with his, about his sin with Uriah's wife. David had a good response. This is what made David a man after God's own heart is that whenever he was confronted with his sin and confronted with his evil and wrongdoing, he didn't get mad and accuse people of judging him. He accepted the truth about the situation, humbled himself, repented and confessed, and got right with God about it. Amen. In America now, we do not want to do that. We want to compare ourselves among ourselves and always measure ourselves. And God said you're not wise to do that. Amen. And so now what's going on out here in this country is is uh, if you say anything and take a stand on any position, you're judging people. And then they'll quote you, Matthew 7, 1. So if you're at Matthew 7, 1, Jesus there in the Sermon on the Mount said, Judge not that you be not judged, and then for what, with what judgment you judge, you, it'll be measured back to you. That's in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 1 there. And uh, he said, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again. And then he goes ahead and talks about, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thine eye? Behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that is of thy brother's eye, out of thy brother's eye. And, uh, and so forth. And, so, and this is great, wonderful, accurate, absolute truth pre and preaching that Jesus is doing there. <clears throat> but what you never hear is that the Bible tells you to judge. They only know this verse. David accepted the righteous judgment with humility. And this is what made him a great man. Uh, we don't, you don't need to turn right there, but in 2 Samuel, I'll show you further how David's heart was about this matter. In 2 Samuel 16, Absalom had, uh, was in the midst of his attempt to overthrow his father's kingdom. And David had crossed uh, the brook Kidron, went up the Mount of Olives, and was moving across the mountaintop. And there was a man by the name of Shimei who was of the house of Saul, whom David had replaced as king. And he come along beside David, and he threw gravel at him. And he cursed David as he went, the Bible said. And I mean, he called him a bloody man. And he, you, God, you're getting what you deserve. And I'm glad God's nailing you now. And you're a bloody man. I mean, he was letting him have it. Now, David, and, but David is surrounded by mighty men. Uh, some of those men, you're right. And, and so, uh, 
One of the men said to David, let me go over and cut that dead dog's head off. Okay. He had no business talking to you like this. Now I want to show you something. David had an attitude about people judging him that we'd all do well. I had a man make a cocky, smirky, I mean, cutting remark at me today, in, uh, this week in a business place. Just turn right around to me and just let me have it. And all I'd, all, and I'd been friendly to him. Waved at him and said, hey, how you doing? He stood on me, turned around and me, just let me have it. But you know something? There was an element of truth, Brother Marcus, about what he said to me. And what the Holy Spirit says, did you? Yeah, that wasn't, you don't like that. But I want you to listen. You could get some good out of that if you'd just take it right. Have a right attitude. Let, it, let the rest of it go. Shimei was throwing these gravel and rock at him and spitting all this stuff at him. And this is what David said. He said, no, don't you go over and kill him. He said, it may be that God has sent him. It may be that God is, he said, and basically what David said, if I had the right response to this, God may give me mercy. It may be that I need to hear some of this. David didn't say, you're judging me. He was judging David. There's no question about it. But David's response is what is important. It was, hey, can I get some good out of this? Do you reckon God sends some people through my life that says things to me that I may not really enjoy hearing? That might at least be some element of the truth about me? That I might ought to listen to? And, and if you read that passage of scripture, David literally humbled himself under the hand of God and said, You know, it may be that God will requite me good for this evil that this man's doing. He didn't start barking at him about you judging me. You ain't got any business. You ain't got any right to judge me. Why don't you take care of your own house and keep your own house in order and all that stuff? And it's the response to that judgment. Now, the first thing we're going to put up on the wall today is righteous judgment. I, I didn't give this to the guys a little bit ago, but they were sure good to try to help me. We're going to look at two things today the Bible teaches about judging. Number one is righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. The Bible teaches it very clearly. And righteous judgment is based upon the clear and rightly divided word of God. The Bible teaches clearly that we're to make judgments constantly in our lives. You are judging my preaching right now, and you should. Amen? If you don't judge your... But how should you judge it? How should you judge my preaching? Is it according to the word of God? But there's a second element in that judgment, and that is... Am I preaching the truth of the Bible in a right spirit? You see, the Bible says to speak the truth in love. The truth can be spoken in a hateful, condemning, hurting way. But be sure that now, we ought to follow the Bible's order. Speak the truth in love. It's never speak love in truth. Speak the truth in love. Now, the first thing that, about righteous judgment, the Bible said in Leviticus 19, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go from the lands to tailbearer among thy people. What are people doing this tailbearing? They're judging somebody. <laughs> okay? And usually not for a good purpose. Thou shalt not. Here's the problem. What is the problem with the tailbearer? All right? Hate thy brother in thine heart. If you love your neighbor, you ain't going to go around telling a bunch of junk on them that's going to hurt them and damage their life. You're not going to do that kind of executional judgment. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 16. I charge your judge at that time, saying, Hear the, ca the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is within me. Ye shall not respect persons, verse 17, in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause is to the two of you bring it to me, and I'll hear it. Now, one thing you want to distinguish as you're reading the Bible is there are civil judgment. This is talking here about a civil case where there's the government, okay? There's the civil courts, and they were to bring... The they were to bring cases to Moses, and they were to make judgment on it and, and to these other judges. Some of the things they said to do there, it says you shall hear the small as well as the great. If you're going to judge whom we're judging, we don't need to judge in respect of people. 
You read there in the book of James earlier talking about when somebody comes into church and somebody's wearing, you know, real nice clothing, they real, real, you know, like they're doing real well. You don't tell them to come up and sit in the front and then somebody comes in, a pair of overhauls and tore up and, and a shoe flaps and flop and there you folks sit in the back. God said, don't you do that. Said, you're, you're, that's it's unrighteous judging. Amen. I'm glad the ground's all level at the cross. Amen. But now here's the big thing. Uh, uh, he said, you hear the small as well as the great. But you should do that personally, not just even in that. Go to Deuteronomy 25, verse number 1. If you can, and we'll keep looking at these scriptures here. If there be a controversy between men and they come into the judgment, the judgment, they shall justify the righteous, watch this, and condemn the wicked. That's righteous judgment. God wants you to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. That's part of righteous judgment. Go ahead to Isaiah 11, verse number 3. And it says there, this is talking about Jesus Christ. He shall make him quick of quick understanding and fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge, watch this, at the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and breath of lips. And of course, that's a prophetic thing, but it does tell you how Jesus Christ judges. Okay, uh, I was talking about your last week. I kind of gave this illustration about the, the, the old elderly couple fighting. Remember the elderly couple fighting? And they got to fight all the time, and he'd pull the shotgun out of the corner of the kitchen, and he'd point it at her and act like he was going to shoot him and pull the trigger. But he never did have it loaded. He just was a ritual. He went through fighting. Some of you fight like that, maybe. I don't know. You pull the, some of you women pull the dish pan up, you know. I'll hit you with this. But anyway, uh, one time they got in a fight, and uh, boy, I mean, it's going at it. He went and grabbed the gun, pulled it at her, and, and, she, and she jumped, and he pulled the trigger, and the gun went off. And she's all to, and she admit, he missed her, and, the, and it went through the window of their apartment. They lived on the ninth floor of an apartment building. It's a true story, by the way. And through that window, and a guy had jumped off the tenth balcony to commit suicide, shot him, and killed him. Yeah. But what they didn't know was that there's a, a the window washer on the seventh floor, and his net caught the guy. But he is dead when he landed in the net. Well, the prosecuting attorney filed charges against the man and said, you killed that man. He said, he hired a lawyer. The lawyer says he didn't kill him. He was committing suicide. It was an accident. How are you going to judge? Remember how Jesus, watch this. Remember how Jesus judged. He said he will not judge by the seeing of his eye or the hearing of his ear. This is the secret that we need to learn today in our church about judging. My daddy used to say, believe nothing you hear and only half of what you see. Believe nothing you hear and only have what you see. Because we don't see well and we don't hear well. How many ever thought you heard somebody say this? You thought they said that. You went and said, he said that. He said, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes, you did. I heard you say, I did not say that. How many ever been in that situation? Amen. Why? Because we're fallen human beings and half of us can't hear good to start with and the rest of us can't talk plain. <laughs> Amen. And we're mixed up all the time about what stuff. That's why I gotta love you because somebody runs up and says, He said that about you. He said that about you. He said that about you. You know what? I'm gonna love you and I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. And I'm not gonna make a judgment off what somebody pops up and says to me about you. All right. Well, anyway, there's in court, and so they kept digging up the evidence, come to find out the the guy that had jumped off the balcony had jumped off the balcony because his mother had taken him out of his inheritance. And, he, and despondency, he jumped out to kill himself. But his mother was the woman that the man shot at. He was living on the floor above him. Well, they said he's still guilty. Until they found out that there was evidence that that boy who jumped off the balcony and got shot is the one who put the shells inside the shotgun, wanting his stepfather to kill his mother. You see, if you don't have all the facts, you don't know how to judge. That's why a judge wants to hear both sides of the argument in court. You see, you know what our news media is doing these days? Unrighteous judgment. You do the wrong thing, you're guilty. I mean, it's over with, out of here, don't even want to hear the other side. Constant, constant mis uh, unrighteous judgment going on. How I many ever? You I mean people don't want to hear the side? They accuse you of this. They don't even want to hear the other side, Phil. You're guilty, doom, damned. It's over with. We've got you executed. And that's where news media is right now. Well, anyway, 
uh, he, he said he'll, he, he'll not with the sight of his lips. Let's go on down to Luke chapter 12, verse 57. Verse 57 there, if we can get to Luke 12, verse 57. They'll get there in a little bit, but we're going to get into some of these things. And you can take your Bibles and go along and write down these references. Luke chapter 7. Well, Luke chapter 12, I'm sorry. Well, you got Luke's, what, verse 57 there. Yea, even why of yourselves judge ye not what is right. Wait a minute, God, I thought you said not to judge. What? Jesus said, now you don't ever hear these clowns quoting that verse. Judge, and yet, yea, why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right. But how are you going to judge what is right? You've got to judge by the word of God. Okay, now let's go to that other verse. Now, you was there ahead of me, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 7, verse 43. Maybe they can get that, 43. Simon answered, I suppose he that he who forgave, and he said, Thou hast rightly judged. Jesus said, You made a judgment, and you judged rightly. You say, Reggie, what are you getting to here? I am telling you that our Lord Jesus Christ taught people to judge, and he taught people to judge righteously. And he's teaching us that you don't always believe what you've seen or what you heard. And if you weren't there, and even if you weren't there, you may have seen it from a different perspective than other people saw it. So be very careful about your judgment. That's the thing. And make sure that you're not doing unrighteous judgment. John chapter 7 verse 24. John 7. Well, you guys are flat out good, man. Aren't they good? That's a blessing. Now, I got preachers who are jumping me because we're doing this. They need to be opening their Bibles. Okay, I'm telling you, open your Bibles. You can't win. You can't win. I still want you to use your Bibles. I'm not putting this up here so you won't use your Bibles. They're judging me. <laughs> You're not a good preacher. All right, look here what it says. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Hmm. Woo! That's a rough one. Well, I don't look, yeah, that don't look right to me. I don't like his appearance. Now, I'll tell you, there is a lot to appearance. Don't you? And you ladies going to the grocery store, you look at them apples. Mm, I don't like the looks of that one. Right? It, that's not a blanket statement. There are things to be judged by appearance, but he wants you to go deeper than appearance, okay? To judge righteously. All right, go to the next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Watch this, but he that is spiritual, and you know what that is? That's not some guy who's hoopy doing. That's some guy who knows the Bible. And has an honest heart about it, doesn't think he's better than anybody else, isn't acting spiritually superior to anybody, but he just knows what the Bible says about an issue. And he's willing to stand on that. And he's making spiritual judgment. He that is spiritual knows and lives the word of God. Okay? He that is spiritual judges all things. How is he judge? Again, how is he judging a matter? If you're not judging out of this book, you're not judging righteously. Okay? All right. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Because he has entered himself into the realm of Christ, and God is his judge. And I'm going to tell you right now, all week long on, on Facebook, I'm a cowboy, hillbilly, redneck, idiot, ought to be put out of my misery, on and on. And they're making those, but I don't, you see, I don't have to let those people bother me because they're not my judge. They're not my judge. They're not making the last call. I don't mind being called a redneck. I don't mind being called a hillbilly. I don't mind being called a cowboy. I don't, mean, I don't mind being called whatever. I ain't suffered for Christ's sake. This is nothing. All right, let's go to the next one. First uh, Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so uh, account of us as ministers of Christ, stewards of the ministry of God. Moreover, it's critical that the man be found faithful. But if it be a very small thing, then I should be judged of you or, man, or man's judgment. Yet I judge not my own self. Boy, there are so many contradictions in the Bible. Because we're supposed to judge ourselves. For I know nothing about myself, yet 
I am I here by justified, but he that just judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Now, what is God telling us here? You don't always know by the outward appearance and the conduct of the people what's really, really going on. And you know that. How many times said, oh, my land, I would have never dreamed they would have done that. Can you believe those, that that guy did that? I would have never thought that of him. Well, I would have never thought that. Why? Because you can just see so deeply. God see the end. He says, hold off that final judgment about everybody. To let, just let God. There's a verse I've written on the whiteboard in our kitchen. It says, commit yourself unto him that judges righteously. Commit yourself unto him that judges righteously. Let people say all they want to do. What counts is when I stand before God. What counts is what God knows is going on in my heart. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if we can, guys. And uh, we'll go to verse number 3. For verily as absent body, the presence of Britain have judged already. Paul, you're doing what? He's judging people there at that church. Okay? Go to verse number 12 in that same passage of Scripture. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. God wanted the church to be judging the situation. There was a man that was committing immorality in the church, and he said, hey, don't sit there like a knot on a log. Judge this situation. Tell what's right. Tell what's wrong. And act on it. All right, chapter 6, verse number 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? That blows them out. <laughs> Guess what? We're going to judge you guys one of these days. Saints are going to judge the world. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Okay. Then he said, if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge or at least esteem the church. Now, this is an inside church judgment situation. And this stuff's true. I'm not going to preach on all this today. But God, what, here's the main thing I'm saying. Don't believe the lie that you're not supposed to judge. God expects you to judge constantly. Every situation, every person you come into, he expects you to discern, to judge, to evaluate that situation and to make things off of that, to decisions off of that. Now, we're going to get something very important here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse number 12, 13, judge ye in yourselves is a coming that a woman pray unto God. Unto him. He's saying, hey, think about things. Look at things over in the biblical thing. Look at verse 31 in that same passage of scripture. For if we, now here's the big one. Here is the big one. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we're not willing to judge ourselves, I think we've got very little business trying to judge anybody else. And this is where God wants to take us to, is that we're honestly judged. But how do we judge ourselves? According again to the word of God. Let's go to chapter 14, verse 24. And then, but if all prophesy, they're coming one to believe, the one to convince, he is judged of all. You know what God's saying? As somebody come into church to minister whatever, people's judging it. And they should. No problem. All right? So those, that is righteous judgment. God wants you to judge according to scripture, according to what's right in the Bible. How many thinks murder is wrong? How do, what's the basis of that? The Bible. You see, it's what God says, whether something's right or wrong, and should be judged according to that. Now we're going to look at, the second thing is unrighteous judgment. That's based on human reasoning. Unrighteous judgment is based upon human reasoning. And uh, that does not mean that they will not use the Bible. And I'm going to show you that later on. Satan twists scripture and people can use it to judge unrighteously, leave out. I always said this, you don't want to listen to what a man preaches, you want to listen to what he doesn't preach. You, don't, you want to, you, you, you want to uh, boy, tonight, I don't know, either tonight or next Sunday, I want to preach on whose righteousness are you trusting. And we're going to talk about this issue of, of the, what is the basis of the idea that you can lose your salvation? What is really underneath all that? And we're going to look at that. And, uh, but, but getting back to this thing here, it's human reasoning, but they can use, use a Bible verse if it supports their twist or they can misapply it. But unrighteous judgment is not aligned with both the spirit and the letter of the word of God. It's one thing to judge on the letter, but it's another thing to judge with the letter and the spirit, okay, of the word of God. Unrighteous judgment, here's where seven, Matthew 7, 1 comes in. You have ill intent toward that person. And you want to damage them. There's motivation of unrighteous judgment. 
Here's the motivation. Number one, oftentimes it's hatred. In our heart, we hate them. And so we're going to judge them unrighteously and try to hurt them and damage them by, what we're, by the judgment that, we've, that we're doing. There's a second thing that causes unrighteous judgment beyond hatred, and that is jealousy and envy. Oh, my. I want to tell you young people something. You listen to me. All across the educational systems of America, young people are being taught in very subtle ways to hate free enterprise, private ownership, and capitalism. By socialist teachers. Socialism is a gospel of greed, jealousy, and envy. And they want to take from the haves and give to, and quote, supposedly give to the have-nots. And they want to keep the big piece of pie in the middle. And socialism is based upon this principle, upon jealousy and upon greed. Let me tell you something. It's not going to do me a nickel's worth of good to look across the fence and see my neighbor doing well and be mad at him because he's got more cows and they're in better shape than I am. What good is it going to do me to say, I hate him because his cows are doing good. His pastures look good. He's driving a better truck. He has a better tractor. I hate his guts over it. Why don't I look across the fence and say, what is he doing that I'm not doing, that I might could do? Why do I have to be jealous and envious? You know, I'm going to tell you how it works in preachers. I ain't but a bunch of hypocrites goes up at that church. Oh, somebody said, well, it said that's two people saved there a couple of weeks ago. Ah, they probably really didn't get saved. That's the way that jealousy and envy stuff works. Anyway, it's not that. But then there's a, here's another thing that, that false, unrighteous judgment is based upon, and that's self-righteousness. This is a big one. Unrighteous judgment is based upon self-righteousness. This is what the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did this constantly. You follow through the Gospels, you will see them constantly judging people, even using Scripture, but doing it unrighteously. But it was because they were self-righteous. And their self-righteousness funneled them into a, a, a path of constant judging people. And then another motivation for unrighteous judgment is to cover our own sin. So we want to go, uh, uh, I don't know, they probably don't have these other scriptures. I don't know what, what, okay, they've got that one there. But I'm going to run through, in Judges chapter 21, verse number 25, at the end of the book of Judges, in that interesting, there's a book about Judges, okay? It says, each man done that which is right in his own eyes. If you and I are doing right in our own eyes, we are not judging ourselves or anybody else according to scripture. There in Romans chapter 2, now let's look at, now we're looking here, we're looking at unrighteous judgment. In Romans chapter 2, therefore thou inexcusable old man, whosoever thou art that judges. What kind of judgment is he talking about here? Because he just told us to judge in 1 Corinthians. He's talking about unrighteous judgment. Here's how it works. Watch this. Remember I said self-righteousness or to cover their own sin? For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. He said, if you're judging people, a lot of times you're doing nothing more but covering your own sin. And if you're doing that, that's wicked. You want to be watch people who are constantly judging because behind the curtain they'll be doing the very things. I, I'll just throw this out at you. All I can see, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm narrow-minded, but I think my Lord did say that straight as the gate narrows the way. So don't, don't be afraid of me calling you narrow-minded. You better be narrow-minded. All right. But all I can see across this country is calling, calling true peaceful protesters insurrectionists and calling insurrectionists peaceful demonstrators. I mean, the same people who last summer said when they were overrunning federal buildings, burning people's houses, turning police cars over, burning police cars, spitting on police people, tearing jack up and killing people, those were all peaceful protesters. That is the kind of judgment, that's that self-righteous judgment. And they're doing, see, they're, they're judging and doing the very things they're judging other people about. Yeah. They, I'm going to tell you something. I don't, 
I know there were probably some Trump supporters in the Capitol up there. No doubt in my mind about it. Be honest, but I don't think that was all that was going on. I know it wasn't all that was going on. There's some honky dory business going on. There was there was some I'm telling you, there was some stage stuff going on there, and that's a fact, whether you want to believe it or not. But irregardless about it, I'm, if they if they want, I don't. I'm not for them going in and doing whatever was done. Not for that. Not not justifying that at all. But what I don't like is why are they so hot on that? And that's so terrible. But all this stuff last summer was peaceful protesting. That's unjust judgment. And we better get that in our hearts and our minds. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and do you do the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? This is, this is good stuff. God said, you be careful about you judging other people. Make sure that your judgment is right, that it's, it's, it's your motivation, your intent is right, and that you're not covering what you're doing yourself, and you're not blaming other people for things you're guilty of yourself and being a hypocrite. Okay, let's go to, to chapter 14, I guess, Romans chapter 14. And... Uh, Verse number, uh, maybe, well, yeah, we did that one. Just above the ones that we did, who know the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, have pleasure in them that do them. And that's what he was leading into that judgment passage about. In chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, he that is weak in the, now this is, hang on here, everybody get a hold of this one. He that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Everybody in church learned this phrase. Doubtful disputations. What is a doubtful disputation? That's something that is not clearly understood or, or set forth in Scripture. For instance, I don't believe y'all dip skull away, man. If you do, you're no good. Well, I used to shoot to the back end, Lord death me, and I talked about it in Sunday school class. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, Thou shalt not dip skull. Just to be honest with you. And there's things that's not spelled out in Scripture that we need to kind of give other people a little bit of slack for. Maybe, maybe they're not there yet. Maybe God hadn't dealt with them. Or maybe they're battling. Maybe they're fighting God about this, that, or the other. Some of you like Tammy Wine. Or, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't give you a dime for all the country rest of music in the country. But it's not your salvation. I mean, I could get up here this morning, and I don't have mine with me, but I could, I could jerk a phone out of my pocket and say, bless God, if you got one of these things, you're hell bound. <laughs> there ain't anything any more nasty or filthy or rotten than that thing right there, and that's the truth. Yeah. Them phones are sending more people to hell today about anything ever happened. Yeah. Messing up more people's lives. Yeah. You see, used to, we all had to watch TV. It was in the living room. Everybody could see what you was watching. Now nobody, you, nobody has to see what you're watching. You can walk in this church and have been watching garbage all week long and nobody, not your wife, not your children, not your mom and daddy, your brother and sister knows a thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I just tell you, you better be watching, it'll destroy you. But I tell you right now, nowhere in the Bible does it say thou shalt not have a phone. You know, hey, a pretty good tool is a shovel, right? Pretty good tool. But if I take that tool and beat your head in with it, I've misused the tool. There's a lot of tools out here that you can misuse. The tool itself is not bad, but it's how you're using the tool. If I dig a ditch with the shovel, it's okay. But if I bash your head in with it, it's not okay. All right? Anyway, let's look at the next one. Uh, let's go to uh, verse number 10 in uh, chapter 14. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what he's saying here in chapter 14? He's saying you got these doubtful dispositions and your disputations. You're disputing over stuff that there's doubt about. Let me give you an example. There were some of them saying in there, you shouldn't eat pork. You shouldn't eat pork. Or you shouldn't eat this. Or, and here was the big one. They were going down... And, my wife, if she'd have been at that time, she'd have went down to the market and bought that meat that had been offered to sacrifices because it's cheaper. And she'd have come back to the house and said, honey, I got this for $1.69. That other stuff cost three, two, three and a quarter. And she'd have been happy about it. And I'd have said, well, that stuff was offered to idol. I ain't eating that junk. You and the kids eat it. If you want to, bless God, I'm too holy to eat it. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't think so. But I'm telling you, it was a big deal. And there were people splitting in the church over it, saying they eat meat to offer to the sacrifices. And the others said, hey, we don't eat that stuff, bless God. I'll tell you right now, if you drink Coke, you're a mess. Now, Dr. Pepper, you're fine. <laughs> See, that's how we are, amen? If, if you do what I do, it'd be all like you used to say, if you sin like I sin, you're all right. But if you don't sin like I sin, you're all bad. Yeah. So you know, just be careful about what we're doing. He's saying there, there's things that, you know, not spelled out exactly in Scripture. And if God hadn't spelled it out, why should I? Amen? I'm going to give you a little bit of slack. I mean, we could get so far to saying, you drive a Chevrolet, you're lost. <laughs> ah, I tell you what, I saw some faces. Some lit up and some went down. And some lit up and some went down. I mean, there's people, I mean, they, they're religious about that. Fords are no good. <laughs> Listen to that. But the Bible don't say drive a Chevy or a Ford. And why would we argue about it? Is this coming across halfway sensible? All right, let's look at verse number 20. Well, let's wait to verse 13. Let us therefore not judge one, but judge this, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. If, if, I don't, I hate liquor, 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 any kind of liquor. Karen, once in a while, will buy this stuff. It looks like a liquor bottle. What is that stuff? NyQuil? <laughs> oh, mercy, six alive. They nailed me. Amen. <laughs> That's Liberty Faith liquor. Go, 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 go. <laughs> We're out. But if you go buy it at the liquor store, isn't, isn't NyQuil 90%? 25. 25? What would 50 do to me? Man. Okay. I don't even know why, what I was preaching. I forgot what I was preaching. <laughs> Where was we at? Where's that? Sparkling grape juice. Sparkling grape juice. That's it. Karen buys sparkling grape juice. How many knows that looks like a liquor bottle? Oh, I know who all now is drinking in this church. You always bobbed your heads like that. Now, let's say, let's just say that I had a bottle of sparkling grape juice in our refrigerator and you came over to eat with us. And you didn't know really anything about sparkling grape juice. You just, uh, you just, Karen said, get the pickles out of the refrigerator, would you? And you reached and got them pickles and they go. <laughs> Pastor's wife's yep. drinking. Here, here's your pickles, Karen. I was over at Pastor's house. She asked me to get a jar of pickles. You'll never believe what was in their refrigerator. I'm talking about a bottle of liquor that big. Enough to share. And I stole it. Amen. Here's what I'm saying is, there may be people who don't even want, Bible, watch this, how I can use this, avoid the very appearance of evil. Yeah. And you've got sparkling grape juice in your refrigerator, it looks like a bottle of whiskey. You low down sorry thing. See where that goes? Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Just don't believe everything you see, everything you hear. Give people a little slack. It may not be just what you think it is, but, it, but, but watch this. Whereby thy brother stumbled. Let's do the scene over again, because some people's like this. Over there, I saw that whiskey, I saw that liquor in their refrigerator. But Lord, I can't tell nobody. But I'm awful disappointed in my preacher. He gets up and says he hates liquor. I don't understand it. Why would a man who gets up and preaches says he hates liquor have liquor in his refrigerator? I don't believe it's medicine, God. I can't believe that. And he sits back here in church for six months. 
And the devil says, he's a hypocrite, 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 he's a hypocrite. If that bottle of sparkling grape juice caused my brother to stumble or make him weak, watch this. That old boy was there. He used to drink. Got saved. Quit drinking. Found out his pastor drinks. Make him weak. The pastor says, all right, drink. I think I'll stop by a liquor store and get me a bottle this week. I won't drink very much, but at least I have a little to take an ocean. I've weakened my brother. Here's the deal. I don't think, I like sparkling grape juice. I especially like it with um, cranberry juice or something like that. NyQuil. 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 <laughs> If I come in here some Sunday morning doing that, you'll know it's sparkling like grape juice and like will. But I'm going to quit talking to you. Every time I talk to you, I forget what I was preaching. Where was I at? The grief of this is terrible. I was drinking NyQuil. I'm just saying this to you. There may be things that aren't so wrong, not wrong. But it's cause your brother to be weak or to stumble. It might be good not to do that. Now, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy. I mean, figure that out. I mean, if you pulled all the furniture out of your house and slept on the floor, there's going to be some people say you're living, God, you're living ungodly. So don't take it that far. But do think about, hey, is this causing a brother to stumble? Is this causing a brother to be made weak? Maybe I ought to think about that a little bit, and you'll not do that, okay? All right, let's go on to the next thing here. I'm tired of preaching on that, amen. That's a whole other subject. Let's get it, James chapter 2. He says, are you done? He's talking about when these people come into church. He said, are you not then partially so to become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brother, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of which you promised them to love him? Ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you, draw you before the judgment seat, blaspheme that holy name. He's talking about, hey, listen, don't be judging people because of their wealth or lack of wealth or position or lack of position or anything like that. Don't respect people in judgment. Colossians chapter 2, and I think we'll finish up on, on these scriptures about unrighteous judgment and try to finish the message up in good land of living. Uh, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day, new moon, or Sabbath days. You know, there's just some things you just can't let people bother you. They don't agree with you about it, but hey, just go on down the road. All right, now, I'm going to finish this up thing up by saying what people, why people and, and God-hating culture crusade against biblical righteous judgment. Now, I do want you to take your Bibles. We're not going to put this up. Genesis 19.9. Genesis 19.9. I want to show you the time you're living in. Genesis 19.9. I'm sorry, folks, but I got to finish this thing. And if you'll hang in with me just a little bit, we'll be done, okay? I promise I'll do my best. Genesis 19, 9, you're, you're at Sodom and Gomorrah. God sent the men down there to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, to take a, a, a lot out, his family. And uh, they come, to, they, and you, you know how the story is. They, they, they stayed with Lot's house. Verse number four, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. They called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Lot went out the door of them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren. That's a bad state to be in when you're calling Sodomites brethren. Do not so wickedly. Now, he may, now did you hear what Lot said? Do not so what? Wickedly. wickedly. Do you know what he did right then? What did he do? He judged them. Watch what they say in verse 8. Behold now, and I'm going to jump verse 8, but it's a filthy thing just for time's sake. Here was their response to Lot's statement. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now here's what the Sodomites said. You're judging me. That's all over America right now. Twitter, Facebook. All your social media, TV programs, nobody's supposed to say that being a sodomite's wicked. You're judging those people. Yep. Let me just tell you something. There's a lot of other things that are wicked we talk about, and you don't say that. Yep. If I say stealing, well, you don't say, well, he's judging somebody. But right here, it tells you about how the culture will turn, turn this position of judging around and use it against you to silence you of saying anything against it. Let, listen to me. The truth be known, 
Most of you right now are afraid to say anything about sodomites in public. Because you know it's not politically correct right now. And their use, this is why I said this is the devil's favorite verse. Because he's using Matthew 7, 1 against us. Telling us to shut up and you don't judge anybody about it. Judge not that you be not judged. Well, I want to know, how about this? What about a pedophile that, that uh, abducts a little child, rapes it, and kills it? Am I supposed to judge? You see, the only thing they don't want you judging, their sin. Well, we've got to try. Go to John chapter 3, verse 17. Yeah, I hate, I'm not, I don't know why anymore I hate being, I hate being preaching long. And I mean it. I don't know why. I used to, I didn't care. And there's a certain thing about it I don't care yet, but I just, I'm, I, I just try to be an example of these younger preachers. Now, John chapter 3, verse number 17, watch why they don't want you judging. He said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Okay, we're not to go around condemning, but that the world through him might be saved. Watch this. He that believeth on him that is not condemned, he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of this only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light, here's the condemnation, that light is coming in the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Listen, that's why lost people don't fill churches up. They expect to hear preaching on their sin. They don't want to hear it. So I said, I'd go church up there if they weren't so judgmental. All they do is judge me. These little Facebook posts going up and down Facebook talking about somebody walking in church and you look at them like that and you're self-righteous stuff. I'm going to tell you something right now. We can love people. We can love people and not judge that they're condemned already. I don't have to judge them. But I'm going to tell you right now, no man who has not been convicted of his sin has any appreciation for the gospel of grace. If you're not a wicked sinner, you know what? You don't need the blood of Jesus for anything. And that involves judging, letting the Bible judge you about your sin. The reason I got saved is because God judged me guilty. Wherefore the law, it says all men are guilty before God. It stops every mouth, shuts their mouth up. You're guilty before God Almighty. And that's, and you ain't going, and that's why Satan does this. Because if we don't judge righteous judgment from the Bible, people will die and go to hell. You're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay. That's why we don't talk to Mormons, why we don't talk, we don't say a word, because we want to be liked by everybody, and we're sure the last thing I would ever want to be said about me is that I judge people. Constant comments on Facebook. I don't judge anybody. I don't judge anybody. I don't judge anybody. I don't judge you. Oh, that makes me, watch it, that makes me righteous. I don't judge anybody. And then call you a hillbilly. <laughs> Turn right around. Do exactly. Remember Romans 2? You judge and then you do the same thing. This is the spirit of don't judge me culture that's behind our entire system right now. Doesn't make any difference. You're, it's bathed in self-righteous judgment. We're not to judge with unholy motives or in self-righteous exalting ourselves, but neither are we to condone sin or wickedness or ungodly conduct. The judge not culture is a satanic movement designed to remove the holy law of God and his standards from our culture and our society, and it is happening right in front of us, and it opens the floodgates of iniquity to hell. The judge not culture is designed from hell to tear down righteousness and to give license to sin. The judge not crowd are in reality God haters, rebellers against the authority of God Almighty. They are humanist self gods. Judging involves authority, it involves absolute truth, and this is why they attack the Word of God. This is what preachers and Christians who have embraced all of the other versions of the Bible do not understand. I could take you to my Facebook feed and show you comments of atheistic agnostics who will tell you, How can you say that when you've got all these different Bibles? I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I don't believe any of your junk. And what you ought to realize, preacher, is that you've got all them different Bibles that don't agree with each other. Your God can't even keep his word straight. You cannot judge me out of a book that doesn't even keep its own book straight. A God that doesn't even keep his own word straight. 
And if preachers in America would understand that God has spoken and he's inspired his word and preserved his word and has authority, I'm going to tell you something, listen to me. We're in a time when Satan has taken this very philosophy, put it in the pulpits of churches. And let me just say something to you. You know what preachers used to say? Thus saith the Lord. You know what they say now? A better translation would be. The wicked are now able to say that you don't have any authority because all of your Bibles say different things. Your God's a liar. He can't keep his word straight. He changed it, so don't judge me. The preachers used to say the Bible says, but now they say in the Greek or the Hebrew. It's not the preacher or the parents or any person's opinion, but it's the what does the Bible say. Now I'm going to close by taking you to John chapter 8, and I want to show you a classic example of unrighteous judgment in the Bible and how people can use the Bible and how the culture is using the Bible to say, judge not that you be not judged, to silence us and to license sin and to open the floodgates of sin. I'll show you how they were doing it in Jesus' day. There's not anything new under the sun. All right, John chapter 8, let's begin at verse 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives early in the morning. Now, isn't that strange? God tells you what time of day this was. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, they they brought her up for judgment, and they're going to use the Bible, listen to me, to judge her. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now, here's the secret to this whole passage of Scripture. I'm 67 years old. I've been preaching nearly 40 years, and I've never heard a preacher preach this that passes Scripture right yet. They were lying. That's not what Moses said at all. Moses never said no such thing. How many knows what Moses did say? In Deuteronomy 22, 22, he said that if if both the man and the woman caught in the act should be stoned. They were not, they were misquoting the Bible. They were just like the devil. They were twisting it to their own destruction to judge and punish somebody. That was probably more righteous than they were. And that's that's what we're talking about, unrighteous judgment. You cannot use the Bible to unrighteously judge people with. Just because they're doing something that's different than you or or try to cover up what you're doing yourself. I'm saying to you that that woman, they, they said, Moses said to stone her. Moses never said to stone the one individual by itself that's caught in adultery. Moses said both of them are to be stoned. Now, all you ever hear preached is how Jesus had compassion on that woman. And as if it's okay to go out and commit adultery as long as you come to Jesus and get fixed. And, and then once in a while, one will be brave enough to say, go and sin no more. But nobody will go back to Deuteronomy 22, 22, which is where they were supposedly taking their position from. If you want to go there, you write it down, check it when you get home. It's Deuteronomy 22, 22. And so what happens is... They were perverting the word of God to pervert judgment. And this was unrighteous judgment. This is what Jesus, this right here in John 8, is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Don't do unrighteous judgment. Judgment that is apart and twisted the Bible to use it. And this is, I want to be honest with you, if our children don't get a hold of this, they will not be a free people. You cannot do unrighteous judgment in a nation and remain free. You have to have righteous judgment. How many of you would like to go before a judge and the judge listen to the other side's complete story and all that they wanted to bring up, every piece of evidence, and then when it come your time, he said, we're not listening to any of yours. I'm going to make a decision. You wouldn't like that, would you? By the way, did you know what's going on in this country? There are court cases, there are court situations all over the country right now where judges are refusing to hear evidence. Did you know that right now in America, this nation as a whole is refusing to hear any other evidence about the election than what one side says? 
this unrighteous judgment, what would be wrong with hearing the other side? Put it out there. Hear it. But no. Exactly. They refuse to hear it. And the reason is because they're making unrighteous judgment. You cannot remain a free people and have unrighteous judgment. By the way, you can't do that in your own personal heart and life. Mom and daddies, listen to me, please. Our kids is raised. But Kenny, we cannot demand and judge our own children for things we're guilty of ourselves and expect them to have any respect for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for our Christian testimony. Let me just tell you what about my family is right here. Not living in home and in the work situation, the love of God. My anger. My impatience. But if my kids got impatient with me, oh, that was bad, man. But it wasn't near as bad if I got impatient with them. And do you know what your kids grow up seeing? Unrighteous judgment. Watch this. This is why it's so dangerous. They will perceive Christianity to be unrighteous. And they will go seek some other form of Christianity or some other religion. Let's stand together. I've held you long enough. Our eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed. I want to ask you something right now. There's one verse I'd like for you to get a hold of. And that is this. Listen to me carefully, please. Online, here in this auditorium. If we will judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. I'm going to ask every person in the sound of my voice right now to do something. I'm going to ask you to judge yourself. Are you saved? Honest to goodness, are you truly born again of the Spirit of God? Is there evidence in your life, fruit in your life that shows that demonstrates just to you, not to everybody else, but to you, that you've been born again of the Spirit of God. Would you please judge yours? God is begging you to judge yourself so that you'll not have to be judged. If there's a Christian, born again person, saved person, are there things in your life today that you know are displeasing to God, but you refuse to deal with it, you refuse to repent of it, you refuse to say, God, I'll surrender to your will? Are there areas of your life where you've rebelled against the Word of God and you will not judge yourself? Let me tell you something. I want to give you some warning. David would not judge himself. We started with him. We're going to finish with him. And God finally had to send a man to judge him. And David was judged in his offspring. That ought to make mom and daddies run to the throne of God's grace and say, God, be merciful to me. Cleanse my unrighteous judgment. Cleanse my ways. If you're here today and you're not saved, and you'd be honest enough to say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I want you to know something. I'm going to be at the front of this church for just a few minutes unless somebody comes. But I'm going to say to you that if you'd like to talk to me about being saved or maybe have questions asked or something that there's barriers in your life or things that you don't understand, whatever, I'd do my best to explain the gospel to you and to lead you to the throne of grace. But at that point, it's between you and Jesus. Between you and the Father. But I'll be here. But if you've judged yourself today and you'd say, you know, I'm going to be honest with my own life. I'm not saved. I'm going to judge honestly today. I'm not saved. And I want this church, and I, as a pastor, want to be a pastor that judges myself. And I'll spend more time judging myself than I will other people. And if I'm going to judge other people, I want to be righteous judgment based upon the Word of God, but righteous judgment that is intended to help people, not hurt people. Righteous judgment, its intent is to help people, not hurt people. Unrighteous judgment is intended to hurt people and tear them down. There's all the difference in the world. Heavenly Father, we bow before you today. And we're so grateful to your precious, precious word. 
God, I tell you, I'd be like a blind man stumbling in an open cemetery without this Bible. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And dear Lord Jesus, you know that I have been so guilty of judging in others the things that I'm guilty of myself. And maybe, Lord, it's because we see ourselves in others and we hate it. But, Lord, today, I thank you that you've made provision for our guilt and our sin through the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can be forgiven, that we can be washed and cleansed. And I thank you, Lord, that we can learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and that by your Spirit, through your Word, we can be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad, Lord, that you put that passage of Scripture in John 8 where they brought that woman caught in the very act of adultery. That Jesus gave her righteous judgment. Lord, that they had no authority to stone only her. And because they did not bring him, they could not stone her. Lord, I thank you that you tell the truth. God, put the spirit of truth in our hearts. Help us to judge ourselves honestly. Lord, help us to judge other people honestly. And help us, Lord, not to believe everything that we've heard or seen. And help us to give them the benefit of the doubt that we would appreciate. Help us to give them the mercy that we would appreciate having given to us. I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray now that it might bless our lives as it conforms us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask this in his precious name. Amen. Love you. See you tonight. I don't know what else to say.